Jesus Christ is without a doubt the most significant man in history. The ministry he founded nearly 2,000 years ago is now the largest religion comprising of over 2 billion Christians of various denominations worldwide. But remarkably, little is known about Jesus except for what is written in the Gospels, which mainly focus on the last few years of his life. So where was Jesus and what was he doing for nearly 30 years before his public ministry? Welcome to Mysteries of the Church. I'm your host, Carolyn Morrison. Join us as we explore some intriguing theories about the missing years of Jesus. As far as we know, no record of Jesus was ever made during his life. Even contemporary historians of his time make no mention of him. In fact, most of what we know about Jesus is from the Gospels, the earliest of which were written nearly 40 years after his death. But the Gospels exclude a significant portion of his life between the ages of 12 and 30, which may seem like a curious omission as to why. When we look to the life of Jesus Christ. There is this huge gap in the boyhood Christology of Jesus Christ. Pretty much between the age of 1 and 12, we don't have any information. There's wild speculation in so many different sources, most of which are not credible. And then when we go between the ages of 12 and around 30, there is even more wild speculation. When we look at the difference between the biography that's written of a famous figure from our own time, we are interested in every single detail, from womb to tomb, and absolutely everything in between. Our obsession with celebrity means that there's no such thing as a private moment, that absolutely everything is open to the, uh, to the, in the eye of the camera or the eye of the, of the microphone. It's not such. Uh, in ancient biographies. When we look at ancient biographies, the question that an ancient biography raises is, why should I care about this person? What is so distinctive about this person that I should care about what this person did or what this person said? So that's the question that the Gospels are answering. Remember, when we read the canonical Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of those gospel writers have a particular audience in which they're trying to address. So what they include and what they don't include are rather interesting parts. Often what they don't include doesn't mean that it's not important. What they're trying to emphasize is a certain aspect of Jesus' life, that that particular community to which that gospel was originally written and geared, to, geared towards would have uh, wanted to hear. The Gospels are not biographies. They are works of theology. They are works to expound the teaching of Jesus. And some of the things that were put in there were meant to show that this was an extraordinary person. So Matthew and Luke give an account of Jesus' birth. Mark does not, and nor does John. They don't have anything. They just start out, you know. John's Gospel is highly theological, starting out with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then a little bit further down, the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. So the notion that uh, they were writing a biography, especially as we understand biography, is wrong. It just, they were, that's not what they were interested to do. Human curiosity being what it was, Obviously, people speculated about the early life of Jesus. Obviously, people speculated about what it might have been to grow up knowing that you were the Son of God. So people wanted to fill in the blanks and fill in the details. And even in the present day, we have uh, contemporary novelists, contemporary authors who write lives of Jesus that focus on the so-called hidden life of Jesus. Naturally, 
The so-called missing years of Jesus has inspired many a theorist to explain where he was and what he was doing during his young adult life. But before we can delve into the theories, we must first consider what we do know about Jesus and his times. As the Bible maintains, Jesus grew up in Nazareth, a working class town in the northern part of ancient Palestine. Like many young boys of his generation, he most likely would have taken up the same trade as his father, Joseph. Joseph is a very important character, I think. You have a very strong silhouette of Joseph in Jesus. Very strong. Number one, Joseph the carpenter. What is a father supposed to do for a son and for the children in a Jewish life in Palestine according to Talmud? Show them the world. While the mother keeps kosher the house, the father takes the children out to show them the world. Joseph was the foster father of Jesus Christ and we know that Joseph was a carpenter. Now Joseph as a carpenter probably means a lot more than he was making shelves and fixing chairs. He probably was more of a general contractor, almost uh, a house builder. We know the old saying like father like son. In antiquity it wasn't a matter for someone's child to choose a career to decide to go to college and become a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant or someone like that. One followed in one's father's footsteps. So when we read in the Gospels, particularly in Mark chapter 6, Jesus is identified as the carpenter. Jesus is identified as the artisan. He's identified as that one from Nazareth. We know you, you're the... And of course he exceeds uh, their expectations. He acts out of what would have been understood to be the sort of way in which someone who was an artisan uh, should have acted. The last depiction of Jesus as a child in the Gospels is as a 12-year-old conversing with the religious teachers in the temple. This familiar story suggests that Jesus was able to read and write and was well-schooled in his Jewish faith. At the age of 12, Jesus showing that he is the teacher of the teachers in the temple, don't you know I'm about my father's business in my father's house, it's again an early affirmation of his own divine identity. So obviously the evangelist Luke needed at that point for, uh, to express to his community that even at an early age, the Lord Jesus Christ was aware of his unique identity as son of God. And even though as we hear in Luke's gospel that he grows in grace, age, and wisdom, even at an early age, he has this special relationship with God, his Father, and, his, and the knowledge, the self-knowledge of his own identity. As subjects of the Roman Empire, the relationship between the Jewish population and their Roman rulers was tenuous at best. Life for a Jew in the first century was often a precarious one. It was tense, very tense, because uh, Caesar, who was represented by Pontius Pilate, uh, wanted money. He was extracting money and taxes and so forth. Um, from the point of view of the empire itself, um, that area of the world was the least attractive for anyone who had political ambitions. And Pontius Pilate wanted to do everything he could to get out of there, but he had to please Caesar to do it, which, by the way, becomes one of the reasons why he listened to the Jews at the time of the crucifixion of Jesus. You know, they said, we have no king but Caesar. And, uh, and that made him very nervous. He didn't want Caesar to, to hear that he was mollycoddling these revolutionaries. When Jesus reemerges in the Gospels as a 30-year-old man, he meets with his cousin John to be baptized. According to one interpretation of the story, it seems that John the Baptist doesn't recognize Jesus right away. Some theorize that this one detail is actually a clue that Jesus was absent from his family for a significant amount of time. When we return, a Russian journalist who asserted he saw proof that Jesus was away in India. Mysteries of the Church will be right back.
Welcome back to Mysteries of the Church. The mystery surrounding the whereabouts of Jesus during his young adult life stem from a lack of historical evidence. An example of evidence would be a written record or account that could be independently verified. For centuries, it was believed that none had existed until a man in the late 1800s decided to take a trip through the Himalayas. Nicholas Nodovich was a Russian aristocrat. He had a rather extraordinary life from what we're told. He was a Cossack, he was a spy, he was an entrepreneur. He traveled around and in the course of his journeys, allegedly, Notovich had gone over to the monastery of Hemis. Hemis was in Ladakh and Ladakh was an area that supposedly had a manuscript that Notovich discovered. Notovich stayed at this monastery to recuperate from a broken leg. And in the monastery, he found this document that was entitled, The Life of Saint Isa, the best of the sons of men. We begin to, to read in this work of Notovich that the Lord Jesus, perhaps, had been trained in the ways of Buddhism. He had learned all the various things of Buddhism and he was rather unique because not only did he learn all the ways of Buddhism, he embraced all castes and that got many upset, particularly the high class, the high caste, the Brahmins. So they wished to put him to death. So in this rather fantastic tale of Nodovich, the Lord Jesus then goes back to his homeland. He begins, Isa, I should say, begins his ministry. And we have basically the story. In 1894, Notovich published his highly controversial book, The Unknown Life of Jesus, putting forth the theory that Jesus and Isa was indeed the same man. Although traveling such a distance wasn't impossible, the idea that Jesus took such a journey was met with much skepticism. There are some people who uh, believe that Jesus traveled as far as India. Well, when we look at the world uh, in which the New Testament was composed, it's important to realize that we're already talking about a very cosmopolitan and already somewhat globalized context, where it's entirely possible that religious and philosophical ideas from India had made their way into the Roman Empire. So perhaps it's not Jesus who made his way to India, but India that made its way into the Greek and Roman world. I think it's just fiction, personally. I think that's just a very interesting fiction because you dealt with a culture that was fascinated by the Near East. Don't forget, even at this time, um, this is where you begin to have the Sax Romer Fu Manchu novels coming out, and the idea of, this, of, the, uh, of the European going and fighting the yellow menace that's uh, in, the, in the East, and this fascination during this time. There's no, there's no reason to believe that. You know, that. We don't have any kind of historical reason to believe that nor do we have a good theological reason to suppose it. Ultimately, there is no historical evidence that Jesus ever made it to India. In fact, the texts that Notovich claimed to have seen were never found again, raising doubts whether or not they really existed in the first place. But Notovich does have his supporters, as his book is still published to this day. When we return, claims about a divine visit to England. Welcome back. You may be familiar with the famous poem, And Did Those Feet in Ancient Time, by the English poet William Blake. Written in 1804, the poem is based on one of the many long-standing traditions that Jesus had visited the English countryside. With no documentation of any such visit, the connection between Jesus and England seems to have stemmed from assumptions about a man portrayed in the Gospels named Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man 
we learn about him in the Gospels. Joseph of Arimathea gave his own tomb so that the Lord Jesus could be buried in that tomb after his crucifixion and death. He was a follower of Jesus Christ, although a secret one, because he didn't want to alienate his fellow members of the Sanhedrin. We're told in the Gospels that he was a believer, but a covert believer because he feared the consequences of going above ground as a believer uh, in terms of fear. It's Joseph of Arimathea who finally gathers up the courage to request that the body of Jesus be released into his custody, and Joseph of Arimathea who provides Jesus with a burial place, the tomb that Joseph of Arimathea had carved out, probably for himself and for his own family. What's unusual about uh, the man is that, unlike so many other characters in the Gospel, we know him by name. So he's certainly an historical figure. He's certainly someone whose memory endured in the memories of the earliest generations of Christians. But more than that, we don't know. And of course, that's led to all sorts of speculation about the whereabouts of Joseph of Arimathea and the Holy Grail and all of that business. The portrayal of Joseph of Arimathea claiming the body of Jesus after the crucifixion indicates he might have been a close relative. This, and the fact that Mary was a widow, presupposes a theory that Joseph of Arimathea was a guardian or father figure to Jesus as a teenager. Another presumption is that Joseph was actively involved in the tin trade between England and Palestine during the first century. If this were all true, it's possible that Jesus could have accompanied him during his trips to and from the British Isles. Joseph of Arimathea, according to some traditions, was a very wealthy merchant of tin. And in some traditions, the Blessed Virgin Mary is alleged to be a niece of Joseph of Arimathea, somehow. In some of the stories, Joseph of Arimathea, in his travels, selling and buying, collecting tin, and being a, a merchant, takes the Lord Jesus with him to England. While in England, he lands in the Glastonbury area. And in the Glastonbury area, he does all these wonderful things. He learns a great deal about, about himself. He teaches. And uh, while he's there, one of the areas that he directly helps to create is an area that would later be called Avalon, which is the realm of the fictional King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. So the stories of Jesus' trips back and forth to the British Isles, as fanciful as they are, as wonderful as they are, are just legends. We don't have any proof. It's not a doctrine or a teaching of our church, nor do we really have much on that, that the Lord Jesus step foot in the, that green and pleasant land, as Shakespeare would call it. As Christianity flourished throughout England, so did the legends of Joseph of Arimathea, one of which asserts that it was Joseph who took the Holy Grail from the Last Supper and hid it somewhere in Britain. And then there's the tradition that he also founded the first church in Glastonbury, predating the church in Rome. But just like the stories about Jesus traveling with him to England, there is no historical evidence to support such claims. First of all, I think this. I do not think that for me there's enough historical evidence for these trips and for these journeys. Why would people say these things? Because I think we're very ill at ease with not knowing a portion of the life of Jesus. There seems to be a silence here. And we're not very comfortable with silence of a person who is such a public figure. And so what we don't know, we need to fill in and we need to um, create stories to, uh, to satisfy that curiosity. The reason why the canonical gospels are approved gospels simply don't include them because in the long run, where he was during that time period isn't all that important. Who he is, the Son of God, the Messiah, 
that's what's important. And what we need to know is that he is the Son of God. He is the Christ, and he has come to save us from our sins. Considering the incredible rise of Christianity and its influence on the world, it's hard to believe that Jesus was relatively unknown during his life. The fact is, no one, not even his followers, wrote about him until long after his death, an indication that he most likely lived a simple, uneventful life in Nazareth before he began preaching. So although there may be a sense of mystery in regards to the details of his life, it shouldn't be a distraction from what he preached. It's the message of Jesus that truly matters. Thank you for watching. I'm Carolyn Morrison, and I hope to see you next time on Mysteries of the Church.